Good morning. I hope all of you enjoyed the yesterday's talks and the party. I see some of you still coming. So before we get to the main presentation, I got a small puzzle for you. Do you know what it is? Or maybe some of you already been there. Those are the headquarters of CERN. And uh, I guess that most of you know what the CERN is. Uh, for those who don't, uh, it stands for European Association for Nuclear Research. And I know that doesn't really add up, but that's because the abbreviation is in French. So don't worry. And if I ask you about um, like what happened at CERN that uh, influenced the highest number of people, what's the biggest invention of CERN that influenced the highest number of human beings, you would probably think, most of you, that it connected to, well, nuclear research, right? Maybe some physics, particles, Stephen Hawking stuff. But actually, the thing made at CERN that hit the most people on this planet is something completely different. And this is what today we proudly call the internet. And of course, it would be a bit uh, of simplification to say that we owe it all to CERN. But this is correct that the very beginning of the technology World Wide Web happened exactly at the CERN labs. And the creator of this uh, probably never imagined to what enormous scale his invention will be developed. He never imagined that along the way some whole new industries will appear, such as, uh, for example, UI design, and front-end development. And those are exactly the two that we are going to talk about today. Uh, my name is uh, Mikołaj Dobrutski, and I'm here for you to talk about uh, designs that code themselves. On a daily basis, I work as a lead designer at Ucreate, a London-based startup studio, but I also work as a designer and front-end developer. And this keynote will be actually dedicated to both of those professions, to designers and to developers. So if there's any part that you don't understand fully, don't worry, I'll be here for you after the talk to answer all your questions. You can also ask a fellow designer or developer of yours on a team. Might be a good conversation starter. But getting back to our CERN labs, at the very beginning of the internet, it wasn't that much of um, design in all of it. It was pretty much only development. You might have seen this. This is the very first website in the world. As you can see, not that much designed. But with time, internet was growing and the audience was growing. Expectations towards how we are building websites uh, grew as well. And people wanted the web to be more visual. People wanted um, tools made to build websites to be more visual. And this is how YC Week editors developed, which stands for what you see is what you get, with some honorable mentions such as, for example, Microsoft front page. Some of the very, close, very first code generators, to be honest. And as you can see, not that black and white anymore. You already see some colors here, some fonts, some images. So it was already some kind of design in development. Of course, not that mature yet. But with time, it got more sophisticated. And developers, I think, kind of realized that they need somebody else in the process. And they need someone to help them with all those visual things. And they found help. They found help among people from related industries, such as print design, or graphic design, poster design. So eventually, uh, the whole process divided into two stages, into design and then development. And of course, well, designers needed a tool. And why would you learn a new tool? Why would you pay for a new tool if you can use a one that you already know? So this was the primary reason why sooner than later the most popular UI tool in the world happens to be Adobe Photoshop. 
not because it was the best feature for UI design, not because it was never meant to be a UI design tool, but pretty much because people already knew it, people already knew how to use it, they had it on their machines, it was a standard in the industry. But Adobe, they made their very best to meet new needs of the users. They introduced some awesome features such as Safe for Web or Slices. Later they even made their own kind of code generating features such as Copy SVG or Copy CSS. You can still find them in Photoshop. But with time it wasn't enough and people needed something else, something a bit better suited for UI design. And probably a team that uh, met those expectations the best was a small independent team of Bohemian Coding who made an app called Sketch. And later other companies were trying to help Sketch in its work and empower it even more. For example, InVision, just focusing on uh, creating clickable prototypes and collaboration. Or Zeppelin, app for handoff uh, that uh, was about to help both designers and developers work together. Later, other tools appeared, for example, Framer. Framer was a tool uh, that at the very beginning was trying to bring designs from Sketch and from Photoshop and turn them into much more interactive, much more real prototypes with much more complicated animations. Important to mention is Figma, the probably the first fully featured UI app uh, available to all platforms, as Sketch or Framer are applications only for macOS. Eventually, even Adobe made their own UX-focused app uh, named Adobe XD, trying to take over the heritage of Photoshop. And this is more or less uh, where many of us are today. We create our designs in Sketch or Adobe XD. We hand off them using tools like InVision Inspect or Zeppelin. And well, the whole process definitely got much smoother, got much smarter than it was, but it still keeps it as two separate stages, design and development. And today I'd like to talk about something a bit different, about a scenario that um, I would like to consider a step forward, but probably for some may sound a bit backwards, about situation when design and development again happen to be one. And I know that this may sound bad, it may sound a bit worrying, probably for both designers and developers, as both of us have some biases on this field. And probably to some extent, most of us already been there and many designers know this feeling when a developer decided to add something to their designs on their own without asking. And the other way around, many developers know this feeling when someone messes up with their code and they say they are developers because they read an article about HTML and CSS. And just to be clear, this is not uh, a talk about uh, should designers code. And this is not another talk about uh, should uh, developers design. So is there something else we can do? Is there something else we can do to bring design and development uh, together? We can generate stuff. We can use some awesome AI algorithm and generate designs. Or we can just uh, bring our designs and generate code and get rid of developers, why not? Mm, actually, no. I mean, mm, I don't want to talk about generating designs, to be honest, but um, generating code is a much more common topic if you search on a web for generating scripts, we'll find like dozens of solutions with sketch to React, sketch to HTML, this to that, all claiming that they are better than the others and eventually smarter and overcoming all the 
severe pain points or generated code. But the bottom line, the truth is that generated code is never cool. Or okay, almost never cool. And if you have like a simple landing page and you just want to put it on the web and you don't have high expectations towards the structure of your code, towards performance, towards responsiveness, maybe you will be quite well off with a generating script. But if your project is a bit more complicated, then you will probably severely fail. And why is that? So what's wrong about generated code with all the AI or how we name it today, machine learning? Like, it's also smart, we should be able to just generate some code, right? Well, not really. Mm, no matter how smart your generating script is, it's still very hard to tell it to follow any internal standards or any processes, any naming conventions. It probably won't be as scalable and as maintainable. It won't be as performant as code written by an experienced uh, developer. It's also really hard to generate code that is accessible. You need to understand the product, you need to understand the user experience to make your product fully accessible. And there are many other technical constraints uh, connected to responsiveness, to animations, etc. So just to sum it up, uh, let me quickly cite the docs of Framer, an app that we already mentioned and that we'll be talking about in a bit. Auto-generated auto code is ultimately almost never ends up in production. And developers want to have full control over every aspect and will typically always rewrite it by hand according to internal standards and processes, period. So is there a middle ground? Is there something else we can do? Yep, I'm here to say that yes, there is something else we can do. And this something else is actually tightly connected to a concept uh, very trendy in the past few years. And I'm speaking here of design systems. Mm. Design system, at least according to InVision, is a collection of reusable components guided by clear standards that can be assembled together to build any number of applications. So that means that um, you build your UIs, you build your applications out of small reusable chunks. And those chunks uh, are not made randomly. They are built according to some very strict rules, to some very clear standards. And they have very clear hierarchy behind it. And this is key for connecting design and development. Because uh, your designs uh, may look consistent, but it doesn't mean that the structure behind it is consistent. And only if uh, you build your UIs in a very structured way, following some very strict set of rules and guides, you can build a design system that will be the same logical and the same structured in your code. And actually, a few teams behind uh, design tools already noticed that and tried to bring it in some way to, to their toolkit. Today we'll meet uh, a few of them. First of them, um, InVision, Design System Manager. Then, the newest version of Framer. And the last one will be Figma, with Figma Web API. But there are also others pursuing similar goals if you'd like to research them yourself, I strongly encourage you to do so. And for example, look for Avocode with the lately released SDK or see what's doing Marvel. Now let's get back to DSM, the Design System Manager by InVision. Design System Manager is cooperating with Sketch. Sketch is currently the most popular UI app. And this is a desktop application for Mac. At the same time, InVision is a web platform where you can bring your designs from Sketch or from Photoshop and click, click, 
create clickable prototypes, collaborate on them. And this team, Envision, built a new product named Envision DSM. That is a platform that provides a simple, unified way to design at scale, but helping teams create, maintain, and evolve a powerful design system. All right, what does it mean? So if we go to DSM and create a new library in the design system manager, this is how it looks like. So we have some colors here, textiles, components, and so on. Let's try to bring our design from sketch into it. So of course, we need to install the Envision plugins to make it cooperate with sketch. And once we've done so, we can get back to sketch. There we will find the Envision design system manager in a toolbar on the right which will open a new window for us. And now we can start adding stuff to our design system. So we can, for example, add some colors. And to, to do so, we need to add it, to add them manually. So we click a class icon, we create a new palette of the colors, we choose the colors from the document and add them to the library. Same for, let's say, textiles for layer styles or for components. So that means that um, everything that is in your library in the DSM needed to be added manually. And every time you want to update something, you need to update it manually. This is of course, uh, this may be seen as both a good and a bad thing, but this gives you a full control over your design system and keeps your DSM library separate from everything that is happening in your sketch file. And now, uh, once we go to the DSM platform on the web, you can browse uh, the whole of your design system there. You can see the colors, textiles, and so on in a very nice uh, web views, which is probably one of the very best uh, features of DSM that lets you very nicely and um, very clearly browse and feature your, your design system. Not only you can browse those things here, you can also get some info about it. So if I would like to learn more about this heading, I can click it, I have a preview of it, and all the properties of this given textile. And I also have a SAS variable here. Let's see what is that. So DSM offers a few integrations, such as CSS, SAS, for Android, for iOS. Let's take a look at SAS at this moment. Mm. So basically what happens here mm, is that every time you create um, some new part of your library, every time you publish a new version of the library, Envision takes some properties, uh, takes some info from your sketch designs and put this information in a style sheet that is available to developers uh, on the DSM under a unique uh, link. So every time you make some changes to the library, those changes go directly to a, a CSS style sheet, and then you can download it and use it in your code. Um, so what exactly is in this style sheet? Uh, what does it mean? What we can bring from the designs to the code? First of all, we can bring colors. So each color you added to the library is now living uh, in the DSM. And you can export it uh, as a SAS variable. And you can customize both the name of the variable and the graphics, so it's kind of flexible. Then you have uh, textiles. So each textile will give you a set of uh, SAS variables uh, responsible for stuff like the size of this uh, textile, the font weight, the color, etc. And actually, at this moment, that's it. So you won't find anything else in DSM so far, but that's probably because it's still under heavy development, so we can expect them to provide much many, much more features soon. 
It doesn't mean that it's completely useless, though. There are still some good use cases to use InVision right now. And well, if you have a simple project, probably I wouldn't be convincing you to do so. But if you have a large project uh, and a lot of people involved, a lot of, say, textiles and colors to keep in sync, then why not? It may actually save you some time. And let's take a look at Framer now. Framer, at the first glance, may look more or less like any other design tool, but in fact, it's a bit different. From the very beginning of Framer, people behind it um, tried to bring code into the design process. So they had an idea that to make um, more interactive prototypes, more um, sophisticated animations, and to make uh, your prototypes just feel more real, uh, we will use JavaScript. And of course, it's not JavaScript that you would later take to your real code and to production. This is code that you use to make a nice prototype, and then when it works, code everything once again from scratch. But this time, with uh, the newest version of Framer, the situation is a bit different, and it actually tries to blend development with uh, design. What the creators of this app says is that the idea behind Framer X is not to generate code for you, but instead to use code you or someone else wrote. All right. So if we have this design created in Framer, like completely visually, using normal design tools, you won't be able to just uh, take it and turn it uh, into code of any kind. But what you can do is you can create those designs with code yourself. Let's try to do so. And maybe recreate some part of it. You can get rid of a button, for example. Now we can get to the components section. Create a new component. Maybe name it um, a button and click create and edit. This will open for us a default text editor, in my case, uh, Visual Studio Code, with a quite simple boilerplate for a React component written in TypeScript. All right, mm, I'm not a master of TypeScript, to be honest, but I'm enough of a hacker man to edit a few CSS values and click Command S. So let's do that. And now when we get back to Framer, we have our fresh new component available in the components panel. So we can take it and grab it to our designs. Now, let's scale it a bit and it looks exactly as intended. But why would we do so? Like, what's the purpose? Well, the difference is that uh, now what we have is a fully functional React component. And this is not uh, just a rectangle in a graphic design tool anymore. This means that we can do with it anything we would do with uh, other React components. So we can connect it to other components, we can add some logic to it, we can add some data inside uh, from the API from any external source. This also means that uh, if you, let's say, have a React app, you can now take your components from this React app and bring them to Framer. And as long as you take care of uh, all the dependencies, they should work exactly as expected. Then you can work on them, you can fix them, tweak them, and once happy with the results, take them from Framer back to your code. Why not? So this definitely sounds interesting. However, Framer X, same as Envision DSM, is also far from finished. Still, if you'd like to give it a try, don't hesitate to do so. And just to sum it up, um, Framer X is still an application focused mostly on mobile design. That's good because 
we are on a mobile conference after all. Um, but also it's focused on micro interactions and on creating uh, advanced uh, animations and advanced interactions in your app. So if you have like a very simple project, probably you will be still better off just creating your designs in, let's say, Sketch and sitting side by side with your developer rather than using uh, complicated tools like Framer. And last but not least, uh, if you want to bring your designs from Framer into code and vice versa, at this moment you need to use React. And this is a bit surprising considering that um, Framer is uh, focused on mobile, but uh, this is what we have for now. And we can hope that they will introduce some alternatives in the future, but for now you need to use React. And let's take a look at Figma now. Figma again is a very special design tool, but this time Figma is different primarily because it's a web application, which means that you can run, run it in your browser, in Firefox, on Chrome, you can use it on your Linux, on Android, on your Chromebook or Windows, wherever you want. This also means that everything you do in Figma lives in a cloud. It means that there is no saving, no syncing, that um, there are no version conflicts. It means that everything you do happens real time. So this, for example, allows you real time collaboration. So you can collaborate on Figma files the same way you would work on a document uh, on Google Drive seeing each other cursor and uh, changes in real time. And the team behind uh, Figma decided to use this advantage in one more very interesting way. And they made Figma Web API that offers a direct integration with the real-time state of design in Figma from a robust Web API and open JSON format. Okay. Let's check what does it really mean. Okay, so we have Figma. Figma, web application, living in a cloud. So all your designs are in this cloud. And what you can do is uh, you can request some information out of those designs. And this API actually can give you two types of information. It has two endpoints. The first of them will give you a full representation of a design file. And the second one will be render of any part of this design as an image. To understand better what both of them mean, um, we need to first understand what's the structure behind um, any design file. And this is actually very similar to, to other design tools. Maybe just naming is a bit different. So the whole of uh, what we see in, in Figma, this is our document, our file. And then each document uh, is built out of pages. So each page uh, can stand like for a separate uh, workspace in your file. And each of those pages will have some frames. So in Sketch or in Adobe XD, this would be an artboard. And usually each uh, artboard, uh, each frame is um, like a separate screen, a separate view. So settings, one frame, newsfeed, another frame. And then each of those frames uh, is built of, well, most preferably components, small reusable parts that you can use in many, par in many places in your project. And those components will be built out of layers. So text layers, shape layers, etc. So this is more or less how we can view the simplified structure of a design file. And well, this is something we can very nicely bring to JSON format. And this is exactly what uh, Figma team did. So the whole of the JSON in this case is our file. And then inside we have pages. And each of those, 
pages, we'll have children which are frames. And inside each frame, the children will be layers, components, groups, and so on. So if we get back to our result, to our output of the Figma Web API, the first type, the full representation of a design file, is exactly what we seen a moment ago. So maybe let's try to dig a bit deeper and understand what we can find inside. Let's check how this blue button looks like in a response from Figma Web API. So, well, first, if we take a look, we see that this is a component named primary button. Cool, we have all the um, dimensions of it and uh, coordinates. We s and there are two children inside. The first of them is a rectangle named background and um, we can get all the details of this rectangle. So what the fill is, which is blue, and what are the effects applied. So there's a blue glow around it. And then mm, we can take a look at the latter child. This will be a text layer. So we see that this is a text layer. We can check what characters are inside this layer, see all the properties of this particular text. So basically, inside the response from Figma Web API, we have all the details about the design file, every single detail. So we can take the response from Figma Web API and basically recreate the whole file, if you would like to. And this is the first type of uh, response from Figma Web API. And then, the second one, means that uh, you can take any part of uh, this design, this frame, this component, this single layer, and render it. Uh, render it to any format you want, uh, to JPEG, to PNG, to SVG. So you can, for example, render the whole page in your designs and get it uh, available under a link uh, hosted on Amazon. Uh, you can render a single frame, a single view. You can render an asset, a photo, an icon. And this is actually very powerful. This is uh, what, for example, GitHub does to sync the entire icon system. So they use Figma Web API to keep their code and their icon system in Figma in sync. Uber use it, and when you enter the Uber office, you can see what the design team is currently working on. A bit scary, but definitely fancy. Mm. And when I've seen this for the very first time, I also get very excited and I thought like, well, well, let's try to use it. Let's see what we can do with it. And as you create, uh, most of the projects we do are in React. So I thought that, well, let's try to bring those um, designs from Figma to React. And as you noticed, I'm not a big fan of um, generating code, but uh, I thought that what we can do instead is to bind what we have in Figma in what we have in React. So as we know, in Figma we have components. And fortunately, in React we also have components. So what we can do for example, is creating a matching set of components in Figma and then a matching component set of components in React and try to bring some information from one to the other. Um, and uh, once, of course, each of those components is unique and we know which one is which, we can just uh, sync information between them. And uh, we can bring some styles from Figma to React, we can uh, bring some content we can also sync uh, assets and uh, we can even go a step further and we can check the hierarchy of your, our components. We can check their order and uh, sync this as well. But of course, first uh, we need to create every component that we have in Figma uh, in React ourselves. And once we have all those ready components, we can just uh, start playing with them. 
let's try to do so. So if we get back to our designs in, in Figma, and we try to bring this view into React using Figma Web API, of course, considering that we have those uh, components ready, mm, this is more or less how this would look like. So Figma Web API, it crawls along the file from bottom to the top, and what it finds first is our button. So it says that, oh, this is a component, uh, and this component is named button. So let's find a matching React component and put it in our code. Um, we can check uh, then what characters are inside, so what's the text in the button, and update it, and put, it is, put this text as children of the component in React. We can check what styles are applied to, to this button and uh, choose the appropriate uh, CSS classes and also add them as uh, classes, as props or whatever you find suitable. We can check uh, what styles are applied to the text inside and also update it accordingly. So basically what I'm trying to say is that um, you can bring anything you want from your files in Figma to your implementation colors, fonts, content, whatever you need. And of course, um, still probably uh, Figma Web API is the most useful if you have uh, complex projects. And if you have like loads of uh, components that you need to work on, that you need to update frequently. And uh, just because of the um, flexibility of uh, this solution, you can also use it for many other purposes. Mm. Ultimately, the sky is the limit here. And if you'd like to start using uh, Figma and Figma Web API, you also don't need to make the huge revolution in your project. You may just start with some little things. You can just bring a few colors out of uh, Figma to your code. You can create a few text styles. You can also maybe just bring assets and just uh, take your icons from Figma to, to your code, uh, some images, photos. You can update content so you no longer have to check copy on the landing page anymore. You can just edit this copy in Figma and it will update automatically. And this won't mess in your, with your code, with your naming conventions in any way. So well, if it sounds so good, Maybe we should just start using it. Or maybe actually we should not. Well, today we've met uh, three amazing tools. Design System Manager by InVision, Framer, the newest version of Framer, and Figma with their web API. And all of them are definitely very interesting tools and they are steps into a very interesting direction but uh, none of them is fully finished and um, none of them will be useful for everyone. And some limitations for all of them still exist. So definitely to use them, you will need to keep your designs super clean and uh, you will need to keep your code super clean as well. That may be a both good and a bad thing. Mm. And some coding limitations, they still do exist. And probably, as I already said, uh, in simple projects, it just may, just may be not worth a candle. But if you have like large projects and large teams and a lot of things to keep in sync, it may actually help you a lot. Um, it may help you remove friction from the process. It may help you make much faster deliveries if implemented correctly. And as a result, uh, it may also ha help you enforce consistency in your design and uh, in your code, which as a result will improve the maintainability of your project by far and uh, help you keep your project healthy. And now maybe even a more important question. How using such solutions will influence my team? how it will influence people I work with. So yeah, definitely it may help uh, to work faster. It may 
uh, remove some tedious part of your work. It may help it, uh, may make it less boring and just focus on what's most creative. But uh, probably the much more important thing is that um, using it may help you a lot to bring designers and developers more together and to bring some mutual learning between them to make designers think much more about how their designs are developed and make your developers think much more about how things are designed. And who knows, maybe actually some designers will start to code and maybe actually some developers will start to design. Well, but at the end of it, um, what's most important that it will definitely bring more understanding and more empathy to your team and much more conversation. So eventually all of us designers, developers and um, everyone in between can live as one big happy family living happily ever after. And this is what I truly, truly wish to all of you today. Thank you. And I think we still have like a few minutes for questions. So if you'd like to ask about something, just go for it. Yeah. Thank you, good talk. So uh, you don't believe in AI models like generating code from designs? Um, I think generating code from designs is a quite a tricky topic and it really depends uh, on a case. So there are definitely some use cases when you can try to generate some part of your code. And uh, who knows, maybe in like f two years from now, maybe in one year from now, uh, it will be completely different and tables will turn. But uh, for now, I'm, what I was trying to say is that uh, if you want to build like fully interactive, fully developed applications, um, it's really hard to generate code especially if you have um, any standards or guidelines you want to follow. Like usually uh, you can try to do, do it to some extent, but uh, sooner than later, most of teams uh, end up uh, rewriting everything from scratch anyway. Okay, thank you. Because Airbnb does it and they do it and they are very happy with it. So I presume for larger teams and for cluster oriented functions, uh, it could actually work out. Yeah, as I said, definitely there are some use cases that you can use for some parts of the application, but uh, you probably won't be, it won't be possible to just generate uh, the whole thing out of your design. Okay. And of course, we are talking here mostly about uh, visual stuff and uh, And how would you end. feel, you know, because you mentioned you're a designer and a front-end developer as well. How would you feel about having and running such a model? Well, I have my fingers crossed for it to get better and better. <laughs> okay, thank you. If you don't have any more questions, then thank you once again and have a nice day at Mobicon. Thank you.